In this episode, once again, we speak to the amazing Tanya Vasello. Tanya is the host of the Courage to Be podcast, one of the top 2.5% ranking podcasts in the world. She's also the founder of the Courage to Be, a global community of high achieving women entrepreneurs working to become financially empowered and independent. She also hosts Increase Your Income and Impact, her signature live event, a help to which helps women to become to expand their business and mindsets. And today we're speaking to Tanya about the top money blocks that stop you from getting a seven-figure business. So let's find out. And if you want to upgrade your money mindset, then click on the link www.millionairefoundations.com and watch my free training. Welcome, welcome. This is Girl Khan, your money mindset expert. And once again, we have the amazing, we have the beautiful, we have the lovely and charming Tanya Waseo. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you. I'm happy to be back. Thank you for having me back. Thank you so much for coming back, Tanya. We had such a fantastic conversation with you on Friday feature. We have to have you back for Money Talkies. So Tanya, everyone's heard your intro once again, but please, in your own words, tell everybody what it is that you do. I'm a business strategist with an emphasis on money mindset and specifically for women. It's not exclusive, but I, women, they just hold a place in my heart because when women can become financially empowered and take a hold of their finances, the world's going to look very, very different. Wonderful. And so today's topic is all about the top money blocks stopping you from achieving your seven figure business. So let's let, let's get some definitions out. What do you mean by money blocks, Tanya? What's your definition of money blocks? So to me, money blocks comes from limiting beliefs. You know, it's uh, I'm sure you teach your audience, your listeners about beliefs. Beliefs get formed from ages zero, from the moment we're born to approximately seven or eight. That's what yep. the psychologists say, because our subconscious mind is is developing but the conscious mind is not developed and that's why everything that we're absorbing from the moment we're born until about seven or eight we really can't discern and we're not taught to discern or to question things so everything's just input that's why they say kids are like sponges because you're they're just seeing listening smelling tasting observing the world and they're making meaning of it into their subconscious mind. And so the meaning they're making is in those beliefs. So say, for example, that you grew up in a family where your parents were always arguing and, the, and that age from zero to seven or eight, you know, and they're always arguing about money. There's never enough money in the family. You see them arguing, maybe the dad's saying to the mom, you know, you bought one more thing. We don't have enough money to buy food or whatever. That's all being uh, imprinted mm -hmm. as a belief and you're giving it meaning. And what you're doing as a little kid, you keep adding and reinforcing that belief with new experiences. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're growing up. And if you've never dealt with your money, you've never, you know, done a course on money mindset, or you've uh, worked on healing your relationship with money, most likely, I know this is bad news, but most likely your seven-year-old is the one that's running your financial life right now or running your business because mm -hmm. it's coming all from that wounded side and from those beliefs that you had as a kid that have been translated to adults. So there's blocks there that we have to detangle. There's beliefs that we have to uh, question because the, no one teaches to question these things at school. So here's the thing. It's not your fault. That's the first thing I want to say. Every one of us has money blocks and money beliefs, limiting money beliefs. Mm -hmm. And it's not your fault that you have them because they've been passed down to you. But it is your responsibility as an adult, if you want change in your life, to start healing it, to start questioning it and understanding where these beliefs came from, who gave them to you. You know, like most likely it's parents, caretakers, teachers, your place of worship, your uh, culture, the media, yeah. all those places were giving you those uh, that information, those beliefs that have turned into money blocks right now. 
perfectly said. I think that's a hundred percent. So you you've you've hit the nail on the head. It for most people, doesn't matter how smart they are, doesn't matter how many you know degrees or masters or PhDs they have. And it's actually the smarter that you are, the more likely it is that your seven-year-old self, the younger version of you, is dictating your money and dealing with money. And that's why you don't have much. And that's why you are you end up self-sabotaging and going into debt and whatever else have you, because your parents are going to be an indicator where you're going to be at a similar age. And I normally do a test for my clients. I tell them to, uh, you know, if you are, if they're above 30, so there's something called, uh, that I call a snapback that happens between the ages of 30 and 40. So if you're aged between 30 and 40, I want you to, you know, when they, when I ask them to close their eyes and see where they were as a child, what kind of money the parents had, what kind of lifestyle they had, and just to gauge of where their parents were with money, if they open their eyes and look around themselves, nine times out of 10, if they're between 30 and 40, they're already there or they're getting there. And if you're above 40, you are most likely to be exactly where your parents were in their 40s. So you replicate your parents' exact life without even knowing to, because you're programmed to do so. You are programmed to go there. You are, for want of a better example, like an airplane, an airplane, you know, is programmed to go from, you know, from London to Japan. And even though wind can shift it off course, it's correcting itself all the way to get to Japan. And it doesn't matter how much the pilot wants it, unless the pilot reprograms it to go to New York, that plane is going to Japan. It doesn't matter how much the pilot wants to the other way around. And this is the same example with your subconscious mind. So this is why money blocks are so important. So thank you for the definition of money blocks. So then now let's talk about the top money blocks that you find in your clients. So talk us through, what's the, what would be the number one money block? And then we go and um, highlight some more. There's several. I think a big one that I encounter, you know, and it's a cultural thing. And I've had this. And, and I also want to preface and add to this. Working on your money mindset is not a one-stop shop. It's oh, no. a, it's an ongoing a constant thing. Yeah. So ongoing thing. Uh, I will share with you, and it's something that I've been working on for a while. It gets easier, you know, the more you work on it, but it's the you have to work hard for money. Yeah. And so I see this over and over, you know, of just the harder you work, you know, the more successful you are, the harder you work, the more money you can make. And I had my own blocks. Like when I started on entrepreneurship, if you listened in the pre previous um, episode, when I was part of this mastermind, I was having a dinner with uh, a woman that was on her way to seven figures. She's already in, at seven figures. And we were having that, it was several of us. And we were having a conversation of taking your business from six to seven figures. And she was at multiple six and she was going into seven. And she's like, I'm like, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, that's so ambitious. Why would I want to take my business to a seven figure business? I'm going to have to work so much harder. I'm going to have to manage a team. I'm going to have to put in more hours. I just need enough, you know, to take care of my expenses, my little luxuries that I like, you know, going out to dinners or traveling. But she said something that stuck with me, which was, well, why wouldn't I want to take my business from a six figure to a seven figure? Now I have more money to give back and it's the same amount of work. And that just kind of blew my mind. You know, I was like, what do you mean it's the same amount of work? You know, like, no, you know, in my head, it was, you're going to, the more you want to make, the harder you have to work for it. Mm. And and it wasn't until I started deconstructing that or challenging it or looking for evidence of women that had been had a seven figure business, especially women that were similar. And I say women because I'm a woman, I'm a mom, you know, so I wanted to look for examples that could debunk that belief of you have to work hard for it. Mm -hmm. So I started seeing other entrepreneurs, some of them working less than 20 hours a week. And I was priding myself of like, oh, I only need to work 20 hours a week. And I had six figures, you know, so it's like, well, could I work only 10 hours a week and hit seven figures, you know, like you start looking for evidence. So that's one of the top money blocks that I see. And the flip side to that too, because you could be like, oh yeah, I identify with that too. Working hard for money is my thing. So the next question you want to ask yourself is, okay, what am I doing about it? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like I identified the, the money block. So the first thing you want to do is fi start finding evidence of the opposite. Like, oh my God, look, goals here single parent 
and seven feet, you know, like, yes, you can do it. You know, mm-hmm. there's that you, there's other people start looking for people that are already doing what it is that you're wanting to do without having to work so yeah. hard. That's the first thing. And then the second part, um, when you're working, when you're thinking that you have to work hard for money because it's a work in progress, like I prefaced it, you're going to self-sabotage. And so yeah. you're going to want to start realizing or having a coach, a mentor, a teacher, a colleague, a community that can reflect back to you, you're self-sabotaging, you're going back into working hard. I'll give you an example with that. Like I caught myself in the middle of a launch. I think it was like a year or two ago. It was maybe one of my events and I was complicating it just because it seemed too easy to make so much money so fast. You know, so I was like, well, let's, I, not that I sat down and complicated and, and made myself yeah. more work, but I was giving myself all this work instead of just saying, wow, could it have been that easy to just create, you know, spend, I don't know how many hours it was like maybe two or three hours putting these emails together. It was for an affiliate thing. And then $5,000 just came in like that, you know, with less than two hours of work. And I was like, no, that's, you know, it's almost like your brain can't digest that. You know, it's like, no, that's not possible. You know, like I can't do that. So I invite you after you're starting to find evidence, you've identified the block, you know, that you have to work hard for money, start looking or surround yourself with people that can reflect back to you. If you are complicating things and you're self-sabotaging subconsciously. Mm, I think that's the key. I think a lot of people, a lot of us can identify with our blocks it's how do we eliminate them how do we remove them so you said find the evidence the cotton that to the contrary the opposite side and then see how you can internalize that and make that your new belief compared to what you already you what you already have i think the the mere fact that you have awareness towards a belief is a starting point it's a great yes. starting point but you do need to dig deep and move and i i don't know if you found this every time i level up I find myself having to go back to this old belief of working hard. And I'll give you an example. So uh, coaching is one of my my businesses. I have uh, properties, a major one for me, because that's where I first went into it. Um, That's how I became uh, a millionaire at the age of 27. Obviously, I lost it all when the the crash happened. The crash, yes. But but anyhow... um, and I've got the, the I've got the property business and I tried a few other things which didn't work. And, and now I'm going into another area altogether and I'm into mergers and acquisitions. So I'm just acquiring businesses. So I'm focusing heavily on M&A. And when I first started my M&A journey and I started speaking to companies, my thought was, I have no idea how to run this company. I'm going to have to learn from scratch. And I caught myself in exactly the same scenario, working hard, learning about this new field and da da da, da. And then I, and I, I literally, my mentor, because I do have, by the way, I recommend mentors. So my mentor had to stop me and say, Gul, you're not getting another job. You're buying a cash flow business. You're buying a business that's already in cash flow. And you're going to have manager in place who are going to run this for you. You are not getting a job. And that's that's where I had to stop. Like, ah. Oh, that's it. <laughs> that's it. And, and I found myself, I had to go back and work on myself because I thought if I have this additional business, it's another seven figure business, I'm going to have to work harder to maintain it. No, I don't. I have, you know, a, I have a, t- a management team in place who are going to run the business for me. And I liaise with the, with the team, obviously, you know, a couple of times, a couple hours a week, but that's the reason why I pay them, you know, good salaries. But it was, it was eye opening for me because I thought I've done so much extensive work on myself yet when I went to a different area, I went back into the same limiting belief. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that because I think it's important that we share these stories to realize because maybe if you're listening to this, you're like, oh, well, goals already got it figured out, you know, like that. Like I'm not in that scenario, you know, like she's already achieved her success. So she doesn't go back to that. 
And it's such a great reminder that new level, new devil, yep. you're going to come back, surround yourself with mentors, you know, with teachers, with people that can reflect back to you so that you can come back to it. Like you said, the most important thing is having that awareness, you know, like yeah. that's the starting point, but it's, it's so great to be able to hear these stories to kind of demystify this thing that. Oh, they have it all figured out. I guarantee you celebrities, multimillionaires are still going through these things, you know, as they're working on their money mindset. This is not, like I said, it's not a one-stop shop. You have to constantly be working on it. It gets easier. It does get easier. I'm sure you solve that faster goal, you know, like mm -hmm. it's where maybe 10 years ago, if you would have done that, you would have spent your wheels and you maybe would have spent six months like panicking with all this, or maybe you would have dropped it but it does get easier. You do catch yourself faster. Um, so there's some hope in that sense. It is. And I think what I want to add is if you have this belief, you won't even try. So because we need to do, you know, 10 years ago, what would I think? I don't think I would even be buying this business. I would think, well, I've got so many other things going on. I've got my kids uh, and I, I will say I'm a full-time mother and I'm a part-time part, part business owner. That's been the, the number one priority for me. My work life revolves around my kids. Yes, I do work in the evenings here and there and I, whatever else, because I have, I take four to seven off. That's the time to pick kids and give them and whatever else. But my, my whole life revolves around my kids. And so therefore there's only so many hours I'm going to be spending on, on work. And if I was, if I had the same mentality 10 years ago, if I was going to, I, I wouldn't even think of going to an additional business. It just, it, it just, it'd be too much for me. And I, I can't handle it. I'm already too busy. I don't have the time. I would say I don't have the time. Now I say, I do have the time because I can make the time. That's normally what I say. I make the time because that's what you do. And I remember this, the reason why I laugh about this now, because you said, you know, what, making the, the 10,000, making tw doing 20 hours a week. That was my goal. That's when I first started out. It seemed so far stitch. Huge. I could make ten thousand dollars ten thousand pounds a month working 20 hours a week i remember saying you know that's my dream job you know making it doing 20 hours a week and making ten thousand pounds a month because i didn't think it was possible until i worked on myself and obviously now it's you know you can make hundred thousand doing the same hours. yes it's the um, next level we it's almost like being in a video game that you reach the next level and it's like okay what are the new goodies that you want you know what's the new thing you want to reach we're going to work on this you know and then you reach the next level and then the next level like you said you can't go from level 1 to like level 5 without doing the work on yourself you know like that's the key you do have to do some work on yourself and pay attention to this and 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 have those mentors and teachers around that can help you out. Wonderful. So that's, I would say that is the number one uh, money block. What additional blocks do you think people have? Oh, I see several. There's the, I'll give you a couple and then we can focus in and see which ones mm. overlap with uh, mm. clients you've worked with. Yeah. The other one that I see a lot too is I'm not good enough or some version of I'm not something enough. I'm not smart yeah. enough. I'm not old enough. I'm not young enough. I'm not yeah. tall enough. I'm not this enough. And so that's just been passed down to you, whether it was your caretakers, your teachers, your parents, your church, your whatever it is, someone has said something to you that you've tackled that on. And so it stops you. It stops you from, you know, you might have suffer from perfectionism, uh, imposter syndrome, you know, like just all these different things that block you because you don't think you're enough with it. Mm -hmm. Another one that I see also is um, not feeling deserving. Like yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm not deserving. Like I have to do something in order to earn it. So it kind of ties in with the working hard with it, you mm -hmm. know, and I, to me, that was there and present and it's still there occasionally, um, growing up, like I'm not deserving of love. If you've mm -hmm. grew up in a family where you had to earn your love, which I'd say a lot of us have been in that place, you know, and especially as parents, we tend to do that. Like, well, if you do that, thank you so much. And you give them a hug or you, you know, you give your kids a hug or you, you're kind of conditioning them that you have to earn your love, but no one needs to earn love or abundance. You know, if we go back to money and abundance, we are, and from the moment we are born, we are inherently deserving. 
Mm. We, we don't need to do anything to prove our abundance. It's there for all of us. Nature doesn't self-select and say, oh, I'm going to feed that tree or I'm going to feed that animal because they're more deserving. They've been doing better. They worked harder to this. That's not how it works. Mm. You are deserving just for being you. And then the other one that we brought up in the previous episode was this whole idea that I'm too spiritual to be concerned about money. Like Mm. I don't need to worry about money or I'd rather focus on happiness than money, or I'm an artist and artists don't need to worry about money. You know, like fill in the blank. I'm too something fill in the blank. So I don't need to worry about money. Well, here's the thing. Money touches everything. Like I've mentioned before, unless you're living like in the Amazons, you're hunting for (laughs) yourself and you have your own hut. Everyone on this planet has a relationship with money, everyone, Mm -hmm. unless you're, you're serving yourself and you don't need to buy food and you don't need to have a home over your head. We all have to interact. It's like saying, I don't want to have a relationship with health. Like, I'm not going to worry about my body. We have to have a relationship with our health and understand our health and get curious about our health and what things are good for us and what things aren't good for us, for our body, because we live and we inhabit a body and it's the same thing with money. So just because you're happy or you want to be happy, it doesn't mean that you don't have a relationship with money. That's like, you're wanting to ignore your relationship with money. It, you know, it, it, you just have to focus on that too. And then the last one, and this one I think would come second in my list of with the clients that I've worked with is some version of money's the root of all evil or people with money are bad or people with money are corrupt because I've seen, like I said, multiple six figure earners, seven figure business owners, or people that inherit a large sum of money and it, it just disappears. There's a reason. It's the same thing as like people that win the lottery. They say that uh, the average lottery winner loses the money within two years. Mm -hmm. So this is the same thing. It's you can inherit money. You can get that bonus. You can get that raise. You can take your business to seven figures. If you have, if you have that underlying limiting belief of people with money are bad, you'll self-sabotage subconsciously. Something will show up where either a big unexpected bill will come, a health problem will come where you have to pay for it. And then you'll, you'll lose it all. And you'll have Mm -hmm. to, you'll go bankrupt. Something will happen where you will lose it if you haven't worked on that. And I, I would say that's like the second biggest one besides I have to work hard for money. Yeah. I mean, I, I think all of the ones you mentioned are, are in sync with what I've seen with people as well. The order may di- the order is different for different people, but they they're all yeah. up there in the top ones for for each individual. This one that you know money is the root of all evil and money is dirty and all of those things. This what I find is I think this is more common in those people who have that multiple six figure and seven figure businesses, but they're unable to keep money. Now, um, I I found this in my life. I, I'm very good at creative businesses and I'm very good at delegating money and you know putting into investments whatever else i just have difficulty keeping money in my purse or in my bank account so the cash flow bank account and um, so i have you know i'm very good at de- and dedicating him and he's going to go with into this investment that pension fund to do this and do this and whatever else and when it comes to money having money for the kids stuff always there like always you know i always pay for the whatever kids need that that's, that's some money always shows up and i manifest it so quickly to pay for good kids things and thinking okay but when it comes to just having cash in my bank it made me uncomfortable and and i thought oh my bank's money's gonna go so i wouldn't even leave money in my bank account i would shift it and put it into one of my other savings things the temporary savings account and then move it back when i need it and that and i thought oh my god i still somewhere have this belief that it's not safe to be with money or it's not mm. good to have money so it's two things it could be either that i don't feel safe with money or my money's going to be taken away someone's going to steal it by you know fraud me or you know taking money out my bank or it, it's just not safe to have money in your current account in your cash flow account and it's it must be one, one of those beliefs and it's this is me, a woman with multiple seven-figure businesses, yet 
it, because it just became apparent I wouldn't have any cash in my in apart from the money that I kept that that was supposed to be my purse you know it would be very limited cash in my my purse and very very limited cash in my actual bank account it was it was so striking to me that it, that that this belief can be so ingrained in you it is and, and I'm a money person so it's easier for me to recognize someone who's who's not as um or not as, as uh, who's not aware as much aware or has done as much research on, on money mindset as I have they would then, if they have this belief, they would somehow cause themselves to do self-sabotage and lose the businesses, lose their money, and or get into debt. There are plenty of seven-figure business owners who are heavily in debt. And where do you think that money belief came from you, Gul? Like, can you pinpoint it to someone oh, in childhood? Oh, 100%. So I know for a fact where my money limited beliefs come from. They come from my mother. My father was uh, exactly... I'm more of my father's daughter than I am my mother's daughter when it comes to business and so forth. My brother, my father came from nothing from Pakistan and to UK in the 60s, built himself up, became exceptionally rich. My mother never became comfortable with money. We went to Pakistan. He decided he wanted to have a younger model as a wife. So he, he we're allowed to have two, you know, multiple wives, I mean, up to four wives. So he took on a, a younger, um, a younger, more beautiful man as wife. My mother then decided to leave him and left him. We went from riches to rags because my father played the financial card and didn't actually um, give her any child support. And I think he assumed that she would come back. She was stubborn as hell, so she didn't come back. But she always put it down to the money. That it was money that was evil. And that made my father evil. And my father was corrupt. And I was fed all these lies about my father as well, that he's corrupt and he's evil and he's this and he's that and whatever. And when I, when I got older, I realized, and so I just put these really negative ideas about men, about money, about wealthy people and all of those things. Because then I, then we grew up in, in a, literally in, in East London. So in a ghetto-like area in East London. So really, we, I grew up in poverty. Um, even though my father would be classified as a billionaire in today's day and age. But anyhow. Um, but that belief that men are evil and money is evil was so deeply ingrained into my mind. It's not safe to have money because men, uh, you know, if you have money, then it corrupts you and it takes you to down the wrong path. And when I got older, I realized my father did make a lot of money, but he was one of the most honest men you can get. I'm very honest. So I get my honesty both from my mother and my father. But in my mother's mind, because he had money, he wasn't honest. And, you know, so, you know, she, she had no idea what business he did because, she you know, he, he obviously that they, they didn't talk about the, to the, the wives, but she thought he's making so much money. He must be doing it the corrupt way, the wrong way. Yes. She had no idea that you can, you know, because there was, he basically um, went into an opportunity when there's a lot of visas going to people going to the Bay because the Bay was coming up and coming at that time. So there was a lot of opportunity and he cashed out on the opportunities, but she saw all this money coming in. She thought he must be doing some, something illegal. And my father's so honest. May he rest in peace. Both have passed away now. But I was given this ideology from my mother that if you make lots of money, it's not done the legal way and it's wrong and it's, it's not right to have it. And I have those beliefs and I've been working on them. But they, it still shows up in some part of my life. And I, I share this and I, I will share this on my podcast to, to highlight to people. You are constantly in a work in progress because every time you level up, you find out a different facet of yourself, a different area of yourself, which, you know, which a limiting belief is just really still there and it's dragging you down. And I didn't realize, I didn't think much too much about cash until I realized woman who has all these businesses should have money in her account. That is fascinating. I love, I, I so appreciate you sharing those stories because I think through stories like those, is how we grow and we can identify and be like, oh my God, I have the same thing that Gold just talked about. Or, mm -hmm. you know, for, I mean, like the deservingness for me, I'm remembering when I was about six years old and I've told this story several times, but they sent my dad and my uncle gave me and my cousin money to go buy the newspaper. It was like a hundred percent. That's like a dollar or whatever. We went to the kiosk, came back with the newspapers my cousin got to keep the change and walked off. My uncle never asked him for the change. My dad asks me for the change. He's like, where's my change? So uh, I gave him the change. But again, it's those situations and those experiences that you're having as a seven-year-old kid 
that I made, I gave them meaning. Here's the other thing too, for everyone listening, money does not, money's not good and money's not bad. Money's neutral. It's neutral. It's neutral. It's a tool and money is just the meaning we give it. At that moment at age seven, I gave it the meaning that I'm not worthy and I'm not deserving of money. The boys are more deserving. There's something like I associated it because he was a boy and my uncle's more generous. I'm not deserving. I'm going to have to do something in order to earn or deserve or feel deserving again. And then you carry that and then you reinforce it with more experiences in your teenage years. And then you reinforce it again in your twenties and then in your thirties. So Unfortunately, the older you are, if you haven't done this work, uh, it's going to resurface because yeah. it's not like you can, j- I wish we could just erase the program, you know, like that programming and reprogram again into our brain, like just, just put a little chip in, but it doesn't work that way. So it's, I think it's fabulous that you can share these stories goal and, um, that we can all share together and be vulnerable and just share where we're like, Oh my God, how could I even believe that? You know, like look at your level of awareness now that you're like, I can't believe that I even believe that from my mom. You know, like I was fed those eyes that she saw it as like, you're seeing it now from the 6,000 foot view. And that's the goal for everyone listening, like that you can start seeing your life from that 6,000 foot view what have you believed up to now? Where did it come from? Don't blame your parents because your mom yeah. did the best she could. My yeah, dad I was did just the best to, yeah. she could. I was just about to say that. Do not do not have judgments for your parents. This is so important because they told they told you what they actually truly believed. And they, a lot of the times, I want to say this, if the programming is done between the ages of zero to seven, then that also means their programming was done between the ages of zero to seven. So they did not know what was going on. And the, their your grandparents, was they were programmed by their parents at the age, age of zero to seven. So this programming has been coming through generations and generations without somebody you know having an awareness of it. But now that you are aware or you can be aware of what programming has been done subconsciously for you, it's your responsibility to change the pattern from this day forward. So the next generation does not inherit your programming that's caused you so much harm up until now. Yes, oh, that was so well said. It reminds me of that story of the of the newly wife, you know, that asked her mom that she's going to roast the the roast. You know that story? Yeah, I, I know the story, yeah. yeah. And she's like, she cuts she, the ends off. Cuts and, the ends. Yeah. And she's asking the mom, like, mom, why did we cut the ends? Like, the oh, husband asks her, why are you cutting the ends of the roast? You know, and she's like, actually, I don't know. I, because my mom always did it that way. She goes to the mom and mom, why do we cut the ends of the roast? And the mom's like, honestly, I don't remember. I, I've always done it that way because grandma used to do it that way. They go to grandma and grandma looks at them and she's like, I cut the ends of the roast because it didn't fit in the pot I had to cook it. And it's like, oh my God, can you believe that? that that's what's been going on with abundance, with money. It's generally generational and it's an ancestral and you really, there's actually uh, scientific proof that what our belief, our ancestors beliefs and feelings and emotions, it gets passed down in our DNA. So it's in our blood, it's in our cells. So it's even more reason like goal saying to, to focus on this, be aware and start breaking, cut those patterns, you know, like it's that's what's been part of your ancestors that's okay bless them say thank you you want to be here without them but let's move on and create new new beliefs now that we live in this day and age you know that we can do it wonderful on that note we're going to wrap up so tanya do you have any parting comments for us Oh, just stay curious. Uh, again, surround yourself with communities where you can talk about money. Don't let it be a taboo. Keep on becoming curious with your own beliefs and how you can uh, shift your mindset from not enough to starting to see all that abundance around you. Fantastic. So Tanya, tell us how can we connect with you? Where can we find you on the internet? Yes. So thanks for bringing that up, Gal. I appreciate it. The first place you can connect with me, you can listen to my new podcast that I launched this year, The Courage to Be. 
And I also want to leave your listeners with a free guide. It's called Amplify Our Abundance. So if you want to access any resources, practices to help you manifest your dreams, your desires, and most importantly, to start shifting that mindset from there's never enough to start seeing the abundance around you. This is a great guide to do it. You'll you'll find practices, uh, resources in there that have helped many of my clients generate millions of dollars. So it's amplifyourabundance.com and you'll have it in the show notes. Thank you so much for asking. Fantastic. So if you are listening to us in any of the podcast platforms, then the, the links that Tanya has just mentioned will be in the show notes. And if you're watching us on YouTube, then down below in the description section we'll have the links as well go check her out and see how she can support you on your abundance journey well thank you so much for being such an amazing guest tanya it's been a fantastic conversation and i've enjoyed every bit of it i say the same thing ditto that i love talking money and abundance it was great thanks for having me Thank you. And thank you for listening to me and Tanya today on Money Talkies. I will be back with another amazing guest, finding out how you and I can build a better business. Until the next time we meet, this is Girl Khan signing off. Take care and bye for now.